Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation this morning, and Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1. Revelation 19, verse 1. If you're using the Pew Bibles, that's on page 1039. The Apostle John writes, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who is seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for uh, all the ways that you have uh, revealed yourself through the uh, written word of God, through creation, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you have given us revelation uh, about things to come. We ask this morning as we look to this uh, revelation about your son and his second coming, that this would be an encouragement to us, and we would all be those who are saying, hallelujah. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Why this passage on Christmas morning, Revelation 19, verse 1 and following? Well, really, there's one kind of a, maybe you could say kind of a silly reason, and one, a hope-filled reason. The kind of silly reason is that one thing that we get to experience every Christmas season is Handel's Messiah. And what's the most famous song of Handel's Messiah? The Hallelujah Chorus. That's derived from this passage. That's where they get most of the Hallelujah Chorus from. So... The kind of silly reason is, why not look at a passage that we associate the, a song with Christmas? Why not look at the passage that that's derived from? So that's kind of a silly reason. But uh, The hope-filled reason is the end of verse 6. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. This is what we have to look forward to at the end of time. All foes, even the most powerful of all time, will be defeated, and it will be clear in heaven and on earth, the Lord God, our, the, Lord, our God the Almighty reigns. Uh, the, the fact of his first coming and all the prophecies that were fulfilled in his first coming assures us of his second coming, and these promises will be fulfilled as well. There's an old saying, uh, and I can't think of the pastor who said it, but I, I love it anyhow. He who came is coming. Jesus already came, and he is coming. Uh, of course, the other passage associated with the Hallelujah Chorus is from Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is just a one-verse summary statement of what you see play out in the rest of the book of Revelation. This is our joy and our hope. And if we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is our destiny to be part of that coming kingdom when Jesus Christ returns. We're glad subjects of that king, even right now. But we look forward to yet that day when the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That all happens at Jesus Christ's return. Now, just to give you a sense of the big picture of Bible prophecy, this is a good brief summary of how we understand things to come. <clears throat> First, I'll point out we are, so 
Jesus is crucified here. Here's Pentecost. This is what's called the church age. So we're in this time frame right here. We look forward to the rapture as the next event for the, the church. This is when all believers in Jesus Christ uh, living, they'll be caught up together with all those who have already died, who will be resurrected. Uh, people will be resurrected, or if they're living, they'll be transformed bodily, conformed to our Lord Jesus Christ. And then begin to unfold many of the uh, aspects that we see in the book of Revelation in this seven-year period that we call the tribulation period. Um, what we're looking at this morning in Revelation 19, we're almost at the very end of that seven-year period, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. The event that we're looking at now happens, I, I can't give you days or probably weeks, but it's very close to the very end of the tribulation and right before the return of Jesus Christ. And then when Jesus Christ returns, there's what we call the millennium. Uh, that's a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on this earth physically. Uh, the, the world will be great. It will be like it was intended to be as it was originally created. Animals and uh, mankind will all be uh, getting along with each other very well. And what we read the passage from Isaiah 11 recently that brings all that out. But uh, the verse from Isaiah verse 11 verse 15 that we just read, excuse me, Revelation 11, verse 15, speaks of Jesus, and it says, He shall reign forever and ever. So we're talking about a thousand years. Where does the ever and ever come in? Well, after the millennium, there's what's called the great white throne judgment. And right before that, this current earth, this current universe flees away. It's basically done away with. And then there's just this great white throne judgment of of the uh, people who've died apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. After that, there's the new heavens and the new earth. And then for all eternity, Jesus Christ will be ruling and reigning with God the Father in the eternal kingdom. So it, he will be reigning forever and ever. It's just this millennial kingdom will merge into the eternal kingdom with Jesus Christ. Here in Revelation 19... We have all heaven rejoicing. They're all saying, hallelujah. What's going on in Revelation 19? The big picture is that we see a big contrast between responses to an event that happened in Revelation 18. Uh, Babylon, we'll talk more about Babylon in a second, but Babylon has fallen. And in Revelation chapter 18, we, we see a lot of people sad about that, and they're mourning about that. There's three different groups. There's kings, and they're mourning, Babylon has fallen, and they're weeping about it, and they're sad about it. And then there's merchants who are getting wealthy off of Babylon the Great, and there's seafaring men and sailors. They're all caught up in the trade and the profit, and they're very sad about Babylon the Great falling. So that's Revelation 18. You come to Revelation 19, and God's people, and from God's perspective, hallelujah, Babylon has fallen. It's a whole different way of looking at this situation. Why would God's people be excited? Why would they be singing and praising and saying hallelujah? Because this city, and again, we'll look at this more in a moment, what Babylon even represents here. But this city, Babylon, from starting in Genesis to here in Revelation, it has been the epitome of rebellion and idolatry. It's, it's been opposed to God's city, Jerusalem, all throughout Scripture. And now Babylon has been judged fully and finally and conclusively. That's what we see in Revelation chapter 19. That's kind of the big picture. Look down to Revelation 19, verse 1, once again. After this, after what? After the revelation given to John in chapters 17 and 18 about the great prostitute Babylon, what she was like, what her judgment was, now comes this new revelation to John. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. 
Now, since verse 5, which we'll get to in a little bit, says, uh, praise our God, all you his servants. I think probably at this point, the, the praise is coming from the angelic host. The multitude at this point is just angels praising God and saying hallelujah here at this point. We've seen from Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 and 11, and chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, there's examples of angels singing in Revelation. So I don't, I don't know if here, if they're singing, it says they're crying out, which uh, I, I think it's probably not just some, some shout or something like that. There's, there's possibly some singing by the angels here at this point as well. They're crying out, hallelujah. I think everyone here in this room is familiar with that term. Uh, you may not be aware that this is the only chapter in the entire New Testament where we find the term hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah is a, what's called a transliteration of a Hebrew term. If you recall, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament, was, as it was originally written, was in Greek. When John is bringing out these visions and these revelations that God is giving to him, what, what he heard, what he saw, was in using this Hebrew word at this point, hallelujah. What's that mean, hallelujah? Literally, it just means praise the Lord. So if you say praise the Lord, you can say praise the Lord. You can say hallelujah. That, that's what that means. Here in Revelation, it's the only place where we see this term in the New Testament. But in the Hebrew, it appears at the end of Psalms 104, 105, 115, 116, 117, at the beginning of Psalms 111 and 112, and at the beginning and end of Psalms 106, 113, 135, and 146. It's, it's in the Psalms, in other words. Here's one example of that where it's used in the Psalms. And it's kind of like what we see here. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. That's hallelujah in Hebrew. And why I say it's kind of similar to what we see here is uh, there, there's both a sense of judgment associated with hallelujah, praise the Lord, and God uh, revealing his righteousness. Look down to Revelation 19, verse 1 again. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Salvation. I take it here, and in this context, it's looking to final, full salvation, where God's even rescuing this earth from the clutches of evil to bring in the kingdom of God into this world. Glory. God's glory will be seen on earth in contrast to the evil that has been running amok in this world, and especially in the tribulation where there's great, great evil happening. And power. Uh, no one, nothing can stop the Lord from accomplishing his purposes. So... The angelic hosts are praising him, saying, Hallelujah! All these qualities are God's, and we praise him. We praise him for who he is and what he's doing, and he's destroyed Babylon. Verse 2, it explains the reason for the praise, the Hallelujah chorus here. Verse 2 of Revelation 19, For his judgments are true and just. Stop there. Certainly, at Christmas, we rejoice uh, in God's grace, we rejoice in his mercy, we, we rejoice in his love. Uh, that's what we think of when Christ comes into the world, all those things, that's because of God's grace that he did that. Here, God is praised for his judgments. It will come. As you see, if you go through the book of Revelation, even in the book of Revelation, there's, there's been uh, some elements of God's grace being displayed. In the midst of his judgments, he is still called out to the people of the world living at that time to repent, turn away from all the idolatry and everything else. So even in Revelation, there's examples of his grace. But certainly God's wrath and judgment is the primary theme of the book of Revelation. 
almost amazingly, as you go through the book and you see here, here's Revelation 19, and it's almost all through. We're almost at the very end of this tribulation period. When you see all the judgments that God has already poured out on the earth, it's almost amazing when you think of it that Babylon has survived up to this point. And not only survived, but, but seemingly thrived up to this point. But here, it's no more. And, and the angelic hosts are praising God. They're saying, your judgments are just. This needed to happen. Unlike any earthly courts or judges who can sometimes get things wrong, uh, they can sometimes be involved with injustice. God's judgments are true and just. He continues in verse 2. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Who's this great prostitute being talked about here? Turn back to the start of this section, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. Revelation 17, verse 1. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls, this is the last of the judgments. There's seal judgments when seals are opened up and then judgments come. And there's trumpet judgments when trumpets are blown, then judgments come. And then there's bull judgments where bulls are dumped out of God's wrath. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. That's what we're seeing here in Revelation 19. Who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. Pause there for a moment. I'm not going to get into any details this morning, but this, I take it, is uh, the Antichrist and the revived Roman Empire that the Antichrist will rule over. Uh, that's this beast that's being talked about here. Verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. So we had this term, this uh, we saw in Revelation 19, verse 1, the great prostitute. We see that referred to here in Revelation 17, verse 1. And we see a fuller description of who this is. Look at verse 5 again. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. This woman, who's the great prostitute, is identified here. And another, I guess we could say a side note. In Revelation, there is... Uh, imagery, for instance, the dragon. Who, who's the dragon? You can, you can yell it out. It's Christmas morning. <laughs> Satan. Yes. Good job. You know it. It's just, I know, I know you don't usually shout it out in our church, so today you can. No, it's Christmas. <laughs> the beast, we said, I just said this, this beast is, uh, that stands for something else, that stands for the Antichrist who will be reigning over uh, this revived Roman Empire. And here, again, the great prostitute. It's not talking about literally a person here, but this great prostitute stands for something. And here in verse 5, what the great prostitute stands for is Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Now, Babylon the Great, at this point, every interpreter says, Amen. There, there's no disagreement. How can you disagree? It just says Babylon the Great. The question is, who or what is Babylon the Great? One very fine and, and common interpretation of that is, and, and I disagree with this, I'm going to show you one way this is interpreted, but 
when I'm showing you this, it doesn't mean, oh, this is what Pastor Scott thinks. No, I'm just showing you. Uh, one way that that's interpreted is uh, more or less apostate religion, the apostate church. Uh, John Walvoord takes this view in his commentary on Revelation. He's a very fine Bible scholar, commentator. He says, the picture of the woman as utterly evil signifies spiritual adultery, portraying those who outwardly and religiously seem to be joined to the true God, but who are untrue to this relationship. The concept here presented enlarged on the previous revelation in 14 verse 8 makes plain that the apostate church has eagerly sought and solicited the adulterous relation with the world political powers and therefore is primarily to be blamed. He continues, The fact that the woman representing the apostate church is in such close association with the beast, which is guilty of utter blasphemy, indicates the depth to which apostasy will ultimately descend. The only form of a world church recognized in the Bible is this apostate world church destined to come into power after the true church has been raptured. There's a lot to commend of this idea. Uh, I don't agree with it, but that's a very common interpretation. There's a lot of good things about that. John Walvoord, very good Bible scholar overall. Uh, one thing why I, I keep saying, yeah, I, uh, this is good, this is good, and, and I disagree with it. Why would I disagree with it then? Uh, look down to verse 18. I just find some of the descriptions of Babylon the Great hard to square with looking at, at a, uh, a church or an apostate church. Look down to verse 18 here in chapter 17. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. From my perspective, it's hard to identify an apostate church simply with a great city. Uh, not impossible, but it doesn't seem to fit the best. And then we see in chapter 18 descriptions of Babylon and the great prostitute in the city that, that make it clear that this, whatever Babylon is, it, it's an economic powerhouse. Again, that's hard to fit with an apostate church that it would just economically be this, this great powerhouse. So here's another interpretation of that, and this is what I believe is true and, and fits this. Uh, the great prostitute, the woman sitting on the beast, refers to Babylon. Now, I... I, I really believe that. I'm, I'm kind of smiling when I say it because that's what the Bible says, Babylon the Great. So I say, yeah, I think it's Babylon, just like what it says. The actual city of Babylon is what I believe this is referring to. This fits well because it actually is a great city. It's not just a concept. It's not just a religion. It fits well because it's literally what the angel identifies the prostitute as in chapter 17, verse 5, Babylon the Great. So why not take it as Babylon? The mystery of verse 5, look at that once again. Uh, Revelation 17, verse 5. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. I, I take it this mystery, uh, this is something that has been previously unrevealed. The mystery of Babylon, what's revealed here is the nature of the evil of Babylon, when it says mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Robert Thomas notes that what's revealed here of Babylon's evil is this vast system of idolatry through the centuries that the great city represents. The system had its beginning on the plains of Shinar through the work of Nimrod and will reach its pinnacle there just before the second advent. So there is this, this religious aspect to it, this idolatry and, and false religion that will be all connected with it as well. Uh, but it, it's all connected, I take it, with a literal city of Babylon. Uh, 
It's going to be tied in with the beast. It's going to be tied in with the Antichrist and the revived Roman Empire. Look over to chapter 18. We see again, this is tied in with, I take it, a literal city. Look how its destruction is spoken of. Revelation 18, verse 15. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? So it, it just, to me, seems very natural to say, yeah, th this is really a city. It's, it's Babylon. It's, it's, it's a city here. Now, is there a Babylon great city today? No. Ancient Babylon, there is some efforts to rebuild it as uh, a historic site. Uh, but, based on what it says here, just like I also believe the Bible would teach, there will be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. I think that's going to happen someday. There will be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. I also believe somehow, some way, there will be a rebuilt Babylon, and it will be in the end times this, this very powerful city and headquarters of a false world religion. That's Babylon. That's what I believe. And I, I, I'll, I'll just throw this out here without developing it. You, you can see cities in the Middle East that are really economically powerful coming up and springing up very quickly as well. I think one is called, uh, I should never just shoot from the hip like this, should I? Leroy, you should shake your head when I do these kind of things to say, no, don't do it. I think it's called Dubai International City, D-I-C, but I don't know. You'll have to check that out. But there are places uh, that have been built up very quickly, and I think Babylon as a rebuilt city, it just shows how quickly something like this could spring up and, and, and be an amazing place. Turn back to chapter 19, verse 3. And it's interesting to me, uh, in Revelation, you have basically chapter 20, which will talk about the millennial kingdom, and you have two entire chapters talking about Babylon, this coming apostate city and the religion, the false religion connected with it. So it's really a big theme in the book of Revelation. Uh, turn back to Revelation 19, verse 3. Here, we're in the midst of the Hallelujah Chorus, this evil place, this evil city. God has judged it. Uh, look at verse 3. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her, Babylon, goes up forever and ever. Again, it reminds us that this is a literal city. It was destroyed and smoke is going up from it. Her judgment was some kind of fire. And interestingly enough, it was caused by the Antichrist and the ten kings along with him. So they're turning on each other, these evil uh, figures of the end times. Uh, you can look at Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17, as that's described there. But the praise here, the hallelujah here, is that this wicked city is finally being judged. Look at verse 4, the praise is joined and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And now all God's people are called to praise this wicked city's destruction. Verse 5, and from the throne came a voice, maybe it was one of the four living creatures, uh, saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. I take it this is all his people from all time who are with the Lord in heaven when this announcement comes. So verse 5 is, is the call. All of you, all of you servants of God, all of God's people, you should join in this as well. And then verse 6. 
Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. It's maybe a little hard this morning to imagine what this would even sound like. Have any of you ever been in groups of, which we have great singers here at this church, but it's not a huge group. Have you ever been a part of a group of maybe a thousand people singing or two thousand people singing or, or more than that? That's an awesome setting to hear singing. This is all the saints, all the servants from all time. I take the angelic host are joining in at this point as well. And, and it says, it's like the roar of many waters and like the sound of peals of thunder. Just think what thunder sounds like. And it's all booming out. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Now maybe this is why there's something built into us as image bearers of God. Maybe this is why we enjoy big choirs and big, you know, big concerts and things like that. It's, it's a little taste of what is to come at the end of time when we're all joining in praise, all believers of God, for he reigns. One Bible scholar puts it like this, Robert Thomas. He said, The victory that results in God's kingdom coming on earth coincides with the removal of all that stands in its way, including the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kingdom he ruled over, and Babylon. In Daniel chapter 2, God's kingdom is pictured as coming to this world and smashing to bits the current kingdoms of the world. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, it says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation, sure. So it's like when God's kingdom comes in the world, it's not going to be kind of sneaking in or anything like that. It's going to smash to bits the existing evil kingdoms of the world, especially the revived Roman Empire. Uh, it, it's awesome as you look through world history. You have these world powers. Uh, you can think back to the Soviet Union. They look so invincible and so powerful. How would they ever be defeated? Nothing could take them down. And yet what happens? They collapse. Something happens. A new kingdom springs up. All throughout history you see kingdoms, powerful kingdoms. They come, they go, they're replaced. God's kingdom. Once it comes in, it will never be destroyed. Jesus will reign forever. Aren't you thankful here this morning as a believer, because you've been born again, that you're a citizen of that coming future kingdom? And that when Jesus Christ returns, you'll be part of that. That's awesome. This is our hope right now in the midst of trying times. We don't have God's kingdom uh, on this earth right now. But it's coming. Jesus is coming. And someday, I take it, we'll all be joining together, singing this very hymn with all the redeemed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Will you be there? Will you be in that kingdom? You can be sure that you will this morning. Mark 1.15, Jesus said this, really at the start of his ministry, he said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is how you can know you'll be there. Whatever your background is, whatever you've done, whatever sins you've committed, uh, however moral you are, the, the call is the same. Repent and believe in the gospel. And, and that's the response that Jesus calls for. And, and if this is your response, you'll be in the kingdom. Repentance is a turning away from uh, your rebellion and your sinfulness and your self-rule. 
to acknowledge Jesus as king. And belief, belief in who Jesus is. That's what we've seen revealed in the pages of Scripture. He's this one who's eternally the Son of God, who came into the world at Bethlehem, so he took on flesh. He's the Messiah. Uh, he's this figure that's hard to even imagine. He's so great. Fully God, fully man. And this one who came, Christ, he came to die for our sin so that we could experience forgiveness. That's, that's really the heart of the good news. Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. So again, whatever the background, whatever good, bad, ugly, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, you can be forgiven. You can experience eternal life. You can know that you'll be there in that kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back because it, Christ has accomplished it all for you. You just need to respond in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. If you've never done so, God calls out to you this morning to do so. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate today. We thank you that he who came is coming and that those of us who've experienced the forgiveness that he offered, the, the transformation that comes along with being born again, we thank you for that. We thank you that we know we have a, a, a certain destiny awaiting us. Unlike this world where it's, uh, there's much evil, there's much bad things, there, there's a coming time when the world will be perfect and ruled by a perfect ruler, your Son, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us as your people to long for that day, to live for that day. And if there be anyone here this morning or, or watching this, this uh, message who's never received your Son, Jesus Christ, today, Father, through your Holy Spirit, would you touch their hearts would you convict them of their sinfulness and their, their need for forgiveness and that you offer full and complete forgiveness? Help them to respond to that, Father, by repenting and believing in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.